highs. Okay, this is Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and I feel wise today. And a much wiser person is Marco Mangelsdorf because he's in Washington, D.C. He joins us from Washington. Hi, Marco. Now watch out about being a wise guy, Jay. You're, you're a good wise guy in every sense of the word. So greetings from, uh, from the nation's uh, capital to you. Let's call this um, dispatch from D.C. Um, what's up? Um, on the national solar scene, and nobody could be better qualified to tell us, A, because he's done this with ProVision Solar for the last 200 years, and B, because he's in Washington, where the, con or the conference took place in Utah, and he was there in Utah at Salt Lake, and now he's in Washington to ruminate about what happened. Marco, tell us about this conference on solar. Well, now you promise never to talk about my age, Jay. So <laughs> let, let me take, take a moment to compose myself and take a deep breath here. So you outed me, but, uh, but hey, we should, we, one shouldn't be ashamed of one's age, right? No, no, no shame. <laughs> yeah, so I decided to, to continue east after um, several days at uh, what is kind of considered the, the be all and end all and uh, big whoop de doo dog and pony solar conference on the planet called Solar Power International, RSPI for short. And this year, the organizers chose the beautiful Salt Lake City in the Utah of all places, which is a little bit of an odd choice. Not that they don't have plenty of sun there, but they don't have a whole lot of solar in terms of uh, uh, rooftop solar, utility scale solar. But nonetheless, it's a charming place to visit. and it's, it's kind of an overwhelming uh, experience. I don't know how many trade shows you've been to in your illustrious wise career, my friend, but uh, this, this particular trade show uh, was uh, one of many that I've attended for almost uh, 40 years. So again, I'm dating myself. Uh, and I, I'd say the number one reason to go is, is usually to see people you don't see otherwise, uh, except for these shows. But also, of course, to kind of get to get a finger on the pulse to see well, what's the solar industry doing, where is it going, who's doing what, where, why, and how. You know, the typical questions that reporters ask. And what's clear to me is that uh, it, it's it's an interesting time um, as far as solar now is becoming more integrally integrally connected to and working harmoniously with uh, with energy storage. So there was no shortage of uh, battery peddlers from Japan, from China, from uh, European uh, countries as well, because uh, the only way we're going to get to most people believe we, we need to go in terms of vastly more intermittent power, uh, non-firm power renewable energy, i.e. solar, and wind is to to take these power sources and, and combine them with uh, with storage, so that we get closer and closer to what the utility companies uh, believe and, and describe as firm power to be able to provide baseload, dispatchable, dependable firm power. So, to me, and specifically for my company, I wanted to see well, what else is out there as far as residential uh, so solar plus storage. And I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go on a little bit of a soapbox here. You know, I've been a, a Tesla certified installer my company has for the past several years. And it's just amazing to me. And of course, I'm somewhat biased, but I'm most, mostly objective. But Tesla continues to lead the pack, not just by a few months, but by seemingly several years. So whether it's automotive for electric vehicles or whether it's for energy storage, both you know, uh, behind the meter, for residential applications and commercial industrial applications and also utility scale is uh, Tesla continues to be far ahead of the pack, in my opinion. But fortunately, other companies, whether it's Sony, a company called Sonen out of Germany, uh, LG, out of uh, which is a part of a big conglomerate, of course, in, in South Korea. So over the next one to two or three years, there's going to be a lot more choice to be able to take a solar electric system, rooftop solar, and uh, utility scale solar, and combine it with uh, cost-effective, reliable, reliable battery storage. So that's kind of my number one takeaway. Well, there's two, there's two things at these conferences that I like to break it down. You know, one, 
<clears throat> is the new technology, and that means the exhibit hall with all the hundreds, probably or thousands of exhibitors who are demonstrating their new technology, their new systems. So what did you see in the exhibits, uh, you know, that turned you on? Was there anything there that was remarkable, that was, uh, you know, ahead of the game, uh, disruptive, if you will? I would have to say on the whole, no, Jay. I mean, um, crystal and solar TV modules have been around since the 1950s and the original solar cells developed by the folks at Bell Labs, uh, gosh, you know, 70 years ago. And the improvements uh, in solar technology have been uh, greater reliability and also higher efficiencies in terms of converting sunlight striking the surface to electricity, actual usable uh, power. But we are reaching kind of the, the practical limits of increased efficiency. I mean, it's definitely been creeping up, but you know, solar modules, the best solar modules on the planet happen to be made by a company called SunPower, and they are a maximum of 23, 24% efficient. Uh, so that's obviously, you know, a quarter. You know, the law of physics says nothing is ever 100% efficient and never will be. But the likelihood of, of in my experience, of 40 plus years of a solar module going to 50 or 60% efficiency, uh, you know, while you can get up, jump up and down and hear about these, the, these reports out of this laboratory in Finland or that laboratory in Japan or, or some tinkerer somewhere, that's achieved a breakthrough or a disruptive solar technology. I mean, uh, I'm kind of jaded in a sense in that I've, I've gotten excited, you know, time after time after time after time, only to find that stuff doesn't seem to make it to the marketplace. So I think we're, we're, we're dealing with incremental increases in efficiency, which is, you know, still a good thing. We're dealing with a substantial decrease in the cost by 80, 90 plus percent over the past 10 years. I mean, the, the cost of solar modules now is, is incredibly cheap, especially compared to only a handful of years ago. So solar, I think, is pretty much down. I mean, in terms of you know, efficiencies are up, liability is up, prices are down, and the, the, the next great frontier is to, as I mentioned before, I combine that with storage, storage on a massive scale, on a massively, uh, exponentially greater scale. So uh, I think that's where kind of the industry is right now. So, you know, to go back to your question, you know, anything that was massively disrupting that I saw, I would have to say no. No, I mean, the only thing that's kind of disruptive is you're wandering through these halls and you know, these vendors have spent tens of thousands of dollars for these glissy displays and, and screens that are 20 by 20. And, show surfers, you know, diving down 50 foot waves and so forth. I mean, that's kind of disruptive to one's psyche, but you know, other than that, as far as technological breakthrough, uh, I would say that's not the case. Well, a couple of thoughts about that, Marco. Um, you know, you probably saw uh, the presence of other, other countries there. Um, for example, China. So beyond uh, South Korea, beyond the US, beyond Germany, uh, I understood that China was making a lot of solar cells. Uh, did you see them there? And did you see, you know, a change in the pie slices on who was contributing to the marketplace, you know, who was feeding in technology, and who was there present there, you know, in, in the conference? Did you, did you see a lot of Asia? Did you see a lot of Europe? Uh, where is it going to? Well, certainly no shortage of, uh, of companies and uh, individuals from the People's Republic of China and to a lesser extent Taiwan. In fact, I was walking down the hall and I saw in the distance, I saw, I think that guy looks familiar. And it turns out to be with my friend Vincent, who works for a company called SunTech in Wuxi, uh, China, which is not far from Shanghai. And I'd met Vincent 15 years ago during my first trip to the People's Republic. And it was an incredible pleasure to see him and to to connect with him, so they have plenty, plenty, plenty Chinese, both in, in terms of photovoltaic modules and also in storage. I mean, if you look at the total market for PV across the planet, uh, I'm going to say that somewhere in the 65 to 70 percent of all photovoltaic production is taking place in the People's Republic of China and uh, and Taiwan. So. A lot of that is is going to to meet domestic 
uh, demands uh, in China. And uh, since the, these tariffs, tariff wars have been going on, gosh, pretty solid for the past seven or eight years, uh, there has been a lot less, or a significantly less Chinese PV coming into the U.S. market mm. uh, compared to four or five years ago. Mm. What about graphene? Did you see any graphene there? You know, graphene, gee, it came up on my radar probably four or five years ago. And I wonder if anybody is trying to commercialize or market graphene. Not that I saw there. And again, you know, my threshold to get my attention, Jay, is uh, what technology, what product is going to be readily commercially available in the near term, as opposed to, oh, this looks super hot in the laboratory. They're getting a 45% efficiency. It's going to revolutionize the market and all sorts of other hyperbolic claims. And uh, I need to see it actually you know, being introduced to market uh, at scale and uh, sticking around for at least one or two or three years because, uh, you know, again, there, there are so many, so, so much uh, spin and, and, and bright, pretty baubles that come out of press releases or somebody touting the latest breakthrough. But uh, to me, it has to be able to make it to market and it has to, uh, to show that it, that it deserves to be there. You know, we've had a number of shows lately about um, hydrogen as a storage mechanism. In other words, uh, the solar runs an electrolyzer, the electrolyzer creates hydrogen. Now the hydrogen can be uh, exported and transported and so forth all over the place in these tanks. Um, and, the, and of course, for vehicles, it's, uh, it's faster to charge your, your hydrogen car than it is your electric car. Uh, I don't know about other you know, uses, but I wonder if there was anybody in this huge conference who was uh, trying to sell hydrogen as a storage storage methodology I did not see anybody uh, then again I wasn't kind of uh, uh, Marco on a mission to find you know homebrew uh, re residential scale um, electro electrolyzers uh, which you know is not something you typically can get to order you cannot order from Home Depot or put an order on Amazon as far as I know so it's it's I think we're a ways away, uh, unfortunately, as far as being able to have a small scale H2 production uh, at a home. I mean, we both know Hank Rogers is ranch on the west side of the Big Island. He, he makes his own hydrogen, but uh, you know, Hank is a, uh, uh, you know, a fairly affluent individual and can, can afford to do really cool stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. which is great and you can set an example. But, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, spend uh, 899 bucks and then pay another 2000 over the next two years through through monthly payments and you'll be able to create your, your own H2, which can uh, you know, compress it into a tank at five or 10,000 PSI and then use that to pump up your, your Toyota Mirai or your Hyundai Santa Fe. I think we're a little bit of ways away from that. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I have talked a number of times uh, about the, uh, the need for and the possibilities of uh, Overnight storage, overnight battery storage uh, with Tesla uh, or uh, well, with other companies that are making Bessoni, um, uh, there's others too. And, and I wonder if you saw anybody who was, uh, you know, either, either realistically or uh, hyperbol hyperbolically suggesting they had a battery system that would go overnight or for days and days uh, while the sky was dark for one reason or another. Did you see any storage systems that were advanced in that way? Well, I mean, it's not, you know, proverbially, uh, for, proverbially it's not rocket science to get storage that's going to last 12, 24, 36 hours. You just need a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. So, so far, utilities, both in Hawaii, uh, i.e. KIUC, and also on the U.S. mainland, are putting in uh, storage for, for solar that typically has maybe four or five, six hours worth of capacity. And, you know, five, six years ago, we didn't even have that. So what is it going to take to go from five or six hours to three or four or five X that? It's just going to take a heck of a lot more storage. And, you know, it is going to take continued decreases in the price of storage and working out the power electronics so that it all plays nicely together. But it's, it's not any type of 
of Einstein type of, of challenge or Hawking type of challenge in terms of, my goodness, how do we figure this out? No, I mean, it's pretty nuts and bolts. You just need a heck of a lot more storage and it's got to come cost effectively. And I have no doubt that as there continues to be more competition amongst the Americans, the Europeans, the Chinese, the Japanese, that storage will come down, it will be more cost effective, and you're going to have more and more utility scale solar and wind that will have much more capacity, much more uh, ability to be able to ride through and provide uh, a discharge, uh, you know, over more and more time. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely happening. Well, I'm, I'm sure the uh, conference was really stimulating. I would have loved to be there. Next time you go, I'll carry your suitcase and we can, you know, examine it together. <laughs> But uh, in the meantime, you had some charts that I think we'd like to discuss, uh, showing a comparison of, uh, what is it, um, 2007 and then more recently, uh, 2009, excuse me, the U.S. energy consumption by source. It's very interesting to see the, the delta factor. Can you explain this chart? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And the, the reason I thought uh, it would be appropriate to, uh, to, to talk about this is, you know, being in the nation's capital is kind of a heady place. Uh, for someone who has uh, uh, spent, spent a fair amount of time in the political science world, uh, which has kind of been a parallel track uh, career-wise for me over the past 40 years, is I thought, well, what can I, well, what, what's going to be kind of juicy to talk about in terms of kind of nat national energy and to try to determine some trends here? So the, the slide that, uh, that you put up there, is total energy consumption in the United States by energy source, and it's measured in, in BTUs or quadrillion BTUs, BTUs being uh, British thermal units. So to me, the takeaways uh, on this particular slide, you see roughly about 94.578 quads of uh, BTUs uh, for, for all of 2009, which is you know roughly 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And you see petroleum there is 37, that gas 25, coal 21 and uh, renewable energy uh, the combined renewable energy of nine percent and then uh, nuclear also at nine so if we go to uh, to the next slide there uh, which is uh, the most recent data i could get eight years later in 2017 i couldn't find anything for this year of course the year is not over and i couldn't find anything as recent as 20 uh, 2017 so uh, i don't know if you Put the, the 2017 slide up. I'm still seeing. Yeah, no, we uh, have it up now. Okay. Okay. So the uh, uh, to me the striking difference uh, in in the course of the past eight years is uh, petroleum. Petroleum is uh, is flat. Uh, is still at 37 percent, and uh, which uh, I guess shouldn't be a surprise, uh, perhaps because petroleum has become more abundant these past seven years in terms of. Uh, from various uh, fracking fields across the continental mainland U.S. So petroleum is, is steady at 37%. Net gas, it went up by four percentage points from 25 to 29. Coal was really striking, Jay. Coal went down by one third from 21% uh, 10 years ago to 14% uh, as of 2017. Of course, that's no big surprise, right? I mean, that's been all over the news these past years, the coal is in effect, uh, I believe, terminal terminal in terms of, yes, we'll continue to have coal plants, but there's no way, despite uh, President Trump's desire to bring coal back, as he's been uh, talking about for the past several years, uh, market forces just are not going to allow that to happen. Uh, nuclear power steady at 9%, same as, uh, as uh, 2009. And then renewables. Uh, went up from uh, nine percentage points to, to, to 11 percent, which is, of course, not not huge. But what kind of struck me is that both uh, solar and wind, although still relatively small percentages of the total total uh, combined uh, production of all renewables, is that solar and wind went up uh, significantly. So mm -hmm. you know, there's there's quite the quite the carving amongst the uh, uh, the non-believers, I'll say, the non-believers from renewable energy, credit the carping as far as, oh, well, solar and wind, too expensive. It would take, you know, the entire state of Texas to have enough solar panels to provide power for the country. And, you know, wind turbines are, are, are big and bulky, and a lot of people don't want them in their backyard and so forth and so on. And 
you know, the reality is, is that solar and wind and other renewables aren't going to happen just overnight. And, 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 and we're seeing, you know, very positive trend lines. And again, with a combination of lower uh, cost renewable energy and lower cost storage, I mean, the future uh, on the macro level looks incredibly bright uh, across the U.S. writ large. Then, you know, I, I asked myself, well, what, what's the, the connection between these macro numbers to what's going on in our little state uh, uh, in the middle of the Pacific? And uh, we are, in some, some sense, we're, we're, we're kind of an island, you know, no puns intended here. I guess actually puns are intended. We're islands into ourselves because, as I think I mentioned to you, and I still find so striking, we use more petroleum to produce electricity in Hawaii than the rest of the, the mainland combined. So we're, we're, we're dealing with a different sets of challenges and issues in, in our isolated state. Yeah, it would be interesting, it'd be interesting to compare that uh, uh, 2017 chart with what's happening in Hawaii. Why don't we put it back up again and make a, a little bit of a comparison? I mean, uh, for sure. example, I think, relatively speaking, we have more solar than, than uh, the, the country <clears throat> as an average. Uh, we probably have less wind in the country as an average, because then on the chart, the national chart shows, uh, oh, gee, wind is three times, more than three times the amount of solar. That's certainly not the case in uh, Hawaii. Um, right. We, uh, you know, we, we don't have any natural gas to speak of. Um, I don't think our biofuels are that much, uh, or our wood for that matter, or our hydroelectric. So it'd be very interesting to make a chart just like this, you know, with the same kind of, you know, divisions and colors and the like, just for Hawaii to, to compare it against the national averages, because it is different. Um, the other thing I want to mention, Marco, and I, I sort of like your view of it, you, you spoke before about demand. And I think that's a very interesting term in terms of energy, especially with climate change. Um, so we have a, a show called uh, Energy in America. We have a fellow named Lou Pudirisi, who is an energy consultant. But <clears throat> uh, over time, it's been clear that he's consulting on oil and gas, mostly. Um, and he goes all over the world. He spends a lot of time in Asia. Most recently, uh, he was in Nanjing a couple of days ago. Uh, reporting for what's going on in, in uh, China, in Nanjing, and, and uh, elsewhere in, in China. And uh, uh, the, the message, you know, that I get out of all of that is that you can say that the U.S. has a certain, mm, a certain uh, direction uh, towards solar um, and renewables in general, but the world is building infrastructure natural gas at a very rapid rate, and the world is using oil. Maybe not so much as you, you know, we saw percentage-wise, you know, a few years ago, but um, the natural gas is, is, is taking, um, is taking the, the share, so to speak, of oil in many places. So what we've got is fossil fuels are actually on the rise, and they are, you know, relative to investment, relative to share of the energy marketplace. Um, and relative to government policy in this country, uh, with your president, Donald Trump. So we're spending a lot of time and money and, and, and policy direction on fossil fuels right now. Uh, and so is China. And so, uh, so are a lot of places. A and so, you know, we talk about these percentages of renewables. We talk about the decline of coal. Uh, we, you know, but the fact is we're in climate change. And uh, Greta Thunberg is not kidding. Um, we are doing exactly what uh, she has told us we're wrong to do, and we're continuing to do it. So our goals, to me, whatever they are, um, are too remote. Our goals, to me, according to Greta, anyway, uh, we're not moving fast enough. And you can watch the weather. You can watch the change in our ecosystems, our environment, our whole planet. And you say, hmm, should we be, uh, shouldn't we be doing something more dramatic here? What's your response to that, Marco? Oh, a lot to unpack there, my friend. Well, I was incredibly moved by that four or so minute speech that uh, Ms. Sundberg gave before uh, a panel there. Uh, she was on a panel at the UN uh, two weeks ago at the General Assembly in New York. Uh, very moved by her, uh, the passion and the anger and the hurt 
Uh, so I, you know, I, I agree wholeheartedly with with her. And of course, the reality is, we, you and I would both agree, is that hydrocarbon-based fuels, i.e., oil, i.e., net gas, and coal, are going to continue for the decades to come to play a very, very big role in in the world's uh, in the world economy and 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 national economies. And uh, that said, you know, we still need to go uh, further, far, further, faster, further, deeper in terms of getting away from hydrocarbon-based fuels and. You know, one of the things that struck me is, uh, as I looked at those two uh, pie charts that uh, that you showed today, is the increase from 2017 to 2009, again, eight years, right? The increase in total quad, quadrillion BTUs, uh, in terms of total energy consumption in the U.S. was 3.3%, okay? 3.3% over eight years. So just stick that in your brain for a moment. I happen to know... It's not because I'm so smart, it's because the data is right out there. I happen to know that many developing countries, uh, including ones I'm interested particularly in the, interested these days in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, those countries are increasing their energy consumption per annum by rates of six, seven, eight, or more percent per year, per year. So you play that out over five or 10 years, you're talking about uh, substantial increases. So, uh, is, is that economy, increase, Marco? Is that increase in in fossil fuels or in renewables? Well, it, it depends on the country. Lao has, is incredibly uh, Lao PDR is incredibly blessed by hydro. So they they make so much of it they export it to the hungry Chinese of the north, the hungry Chinese of the south. But uh, Vietnam, for example, they are a kind of a, a really important crossroads in terms of. Their economy is bubbling along. We'll continue to do so for the you know, foreseeable future, they hope. And, if, and we have this direct relationship uh, these past decades where more economic growth corresponds commensurately with higher energy use because uh, that's just kind of the way it's been. So they're at a crossroads in terms of they need a heck of a lot more electricity. Where is it going to come from? So they're talking to the Americans. They're talking to, to the, the Chinese. They're talking to the Russians. Uh, so it's kind of all in in terms of we need more electricity. Where is it going to come from? So it's not an academic exercise to these people. And it, it really portends, you know, for some serious decisions as far as whether the Socialist Republic of Vietnam uh, decides to go on a more soft energy path or, or, or believe that the, the costs are such, the economics are such, that uh, cheap coal from Australia or uh, nuclear plants from, from elsewhere are the ways to go. But again, I'm so struck by, we become, the American, the United States has become much less energy intensive in terms of breaking that traditional relationship between quantitative economic growth leading to quantitative e increase in energy. We're becoming, we become much better, one of the world's best in terms of doing that, but developing countries, many of them, are still very much locked into that. The greater the economic growth, the more energy they need. So that, that's a real concern. Well, I think the U.S. could be a leader, was a leader. It's not a leader now. Trump is not a leader in this. In fact, it's just the other way. I mean, he, he's, uh, he's, he's left uh, COP 21, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and the whole notion of uh, climate change is amazing. In a time where climate change is revealed every day, uh, he still rejects it. And so, what, you know, what I come to think of, you know, is an irony about Hawaii being ahead in its way on, um, on, on renewables. Um, it's not enough. We, we, can't, we can't stop climate change here in these islands. We're just too small. But we can develop it here. We can develop a, an energy system that is more and more renewable and something we can be proud of and export and go speak about. And just like Greta Thunberg, uh, makes an appearance at the UN, um, you know, and and stirs people up over the issue, raises raises consciousness about it. Uh, Hawaii could do it too. This would be a very uh, elemosinary thing for us to do to send emissaries like you, for example, um, to speak to other places and say, wait a minute, you guys, uh, here's what we've done in Hawaii. We want to do it better, uh, and we want you to do it better. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, it's it's certainly worth. Just a second. It's certainly worth uh, uh, our effort to try to be a leader, even if the country itself is not being a leader.
Just a second, right well, there. Could, Just one second. I, <sighs> okay. Yeah, you there? Yes, I, I was just going to say I couldn't agree more, and I'm, you know, it's easy to get uh, kind of downcast by the challenges ahead, but then, you know, we do have people like Hank Rogers uh, and people like Jeff Evan at Value Act and, uh, you know, Stan Osterman and, uh, and uh, the folks at uh, Elemental uh, Accelerator uh, and other other people who are committed, passionate, bright, dedicated to trying to not trying, but also you know make, actually making happen that uh, Hawaii is on on the forefront in terms of uh, of the energy transition. Uh, that's not just kind of a luxury. I mean, to me, it's an absolute necessity. And while I may have issues at times with with Governor Ige. Uh, in terms of his decisiveness, uh, I mean, uh, the, the state government uh, is, you know, in fits of the starts, is moving in the right direction. So I, you know, we need, as I think we've spoken about before, we need multiple champions who are out there, you know, beating the drum day after day, year after year, and continuing to uh, to challenge us to to do to do what we're doing faster with, with more conviction. Well, we, we've spoken about it before. We need to speak about it again. We need to talk about whether our, our goals and targets are realistic, uh, and for that matter, whether we can move them up faster and, and thus be even more uh, an example for the world to follow. And we should talk about the kind of things and people that we would send overseas to talk about this and to uh, blow our own horn, but also to make a contribution to the world conversation and, uh, in effect, participate in saving the planet. Marco, you and I, uh, we really have great conversations, and I'm looking forward to the next one uh, when you're back, in two weeks, I guess, right? Yes, yes, indeed. And I've, I've confirmed uh, with a little bit of luck that uh, Mary Powell, uh, who is current CEO of Green Mountain Power. She will be joining us um, uh, in about a month in November for, for a show, and she's, she's going to be great. She just uh, recently announced she is resigning, uh, retiring from the CEO position of Green Mountain Power later this year uh, to allow for uh, in bigger, bolder opportunities. And uh, I'm, I'm real happy that she'll be joining us because she's just uh, she's stellar. That's great, Marco. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Aloha. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.